My name is Chikako Takeshita. Oh. My name is Chikako Takeshita, and I'm um, associate professor in gender and sexuality studies at UC Riverside. And my name's Ruth Guthrie, and I'm a professor of information systems at Cal Poly Pomona. Who else is here? No. Ron's Nobody's here. I don't listening? think he has voice access, but he's the librarian at um, West Hills Lemoore. OK. All right, then. Let's get started, then. OK, so we'll, we'll be talking about mobilizing faculty and exist and mobilizing existing resources for the AB 798 proposal. Um, so I've heard that um, proposers are a little bit anxious about getting faculty involved in the project. Um, so I want to uh, say that you should rest assured because some faculty will be very receptive um, based on my, my um, experience at UCR, but you will also encounter some um, openly uh, open objections from some faculty, which I can talk about if you'd like, but um, based if uh, there will be faculty who write their own textbooks that um, that will be not so happy with the OER. Um, there are also uh, faculty who believe that the quality of free textbooks are not up to par and so forth. So you will hear from these people, but uh, in my experience, more faculty are receptive of uh, adopting OER than those who are not. Um, so this might be obvious to you, but well, you have to recruit your faculty first. And I have done it in three ways at UCR. Uh, one is to send mass email or survey to all the um, faculty members on campus and ask them to respond if they're interested in uh, an OER adoption program. I've also sent targeted emails to faculty whose courses seem to fit the objective that I had. Um, Mainly for UCR, it was to find high-impact courses, um, students with lots of in, uh, um, many student enrollment and expensive textbook use. Um, so I have sent targeted emails to these instructors and asked them if they could be, be a pilot project for our um, affordable course material initiative. I've also presented at um, workshops, and I haven't done this yet, but um, another possibility is to do a presentation at department meetings and recruit faculty who are interested. So I'm going to give you examples of the mass email and the survey, um, as well as the two other recruitment tools that I just talked about. So this is one that I've sent to, uh, well, I'm about to send to all the faculty. Um, it's a quick survey, and because this is sort of like the third survey that I sent out to all my faculty, I don't go into details about what OER is, but I just say we're, we're looking at doing an OER adoption program. If you're interested, um, please respond to this email. Uh, particularly if you're teaching a high impact course during the summer or the next academic year. And the survey looks kind of like this. So you ask them to put, put their course information, um, how many students will be in, enrolled, what the current textbook is, and how much it costs, and um, if they have an OER in mind, what that is. And, they, and we also added a few questions um, asking them faculty to respond to uh, what their motivations are for OER or how, what, what kind of characteristics would um, um, inspire them to adopt an OER, um, what kind of workload are they looking for if they were to adopt OER, 
uh, what kind of support they would require from us if they were to adopt OER, and what do you think the obstacles are for faculty to um, advance OER at, at our institution? So this is the survey that I am about to send to UCR faculty in order to recruit uh, people who um, will participate in our project during the next academic year. So another example is a targeted email that I have sent. This was my first attempt to recruit faculty, and what I did was I looked at all the, looked at the course schedule and found classes that um, looked like they were high impact and sent email to each of the faculty. So it says, Professor X, Y, and Z, um, we're emailing you because you teach this particular class, social psychology, that I go on to explaining what OER is, what's going on nationally, um, and why OER is good. Um, and then I explained our project, and then um, what faculty would get for participating in our initiatives. And what I did was, for each of the faculty that I emailed, I identified OER textbooks that looked like they might be able to use. So for specific courses, I did my homework um, beforehand and presented these books to these faculty and said we'd be glad to answer any questions, et cetera. And by doing this, we found a few um, faculty who are willing to to um, participate in, in the full project. And out of those faculty, we narrowed it down to two because apparently um, some faculty did say, yes, I'm interested, but then we weren't able to find um, a suitable textbook for them. Um, third example is presentations. So my presentation looks like this. Um, yours might look different, but I presented to the Academic Senate Committee on Library and Communications, um, and you can do similar things with departments. But mine starts like this. Um, at UCR, appealing to how much the textbook costs is um, the most sort of impactful way to uh, to present this kind of initiative because um, our students are um, the most unprivileged, well, the the most um, low, the lowest socioeconomic uh, profile. And then I show the infographics from um, San Francisco State, and just to point out that. Uh, a third of the students at San Francisco State said that they don't buy textbooks um, more than half the time. Um, and the reason being because it's too expensive um, or because the material is not used as much uh, or they find other ways to get access to the textbook. Um, and 60% of the students answered that if they don't have a course material, then they do struggle in the class more than if they had. And then I have this slide, OER is hot, so what's going on in terms of legislation, just like the one that we are trying to promote, the AB 798, um, and I talk a little bit about the campus initiatives that are going on and say, you know, we have to get on the band bandwagon and do our own things too. Um, and then I talk a little bit about OER advantages, which include cost savings, um, flexibility in terms of remixing material, um, and portability, so students can read on their smartphones, tablets, computers, etc., which um, seems to be very popular. And then I'm going to pass it on to Ruth to um, go into a little more detail about OER advantage for faculty that you can pitch to them um, to motivate them to participate. So, 
Can you, Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah. Good. I hope uh, no more technical errors. Um, so, so talking to faculty about why they'd want to do this, and a lot of faculty are very motivated to do this. So it empowers faculty to offer the student course materials to be successful for free. And in my own course in the CIS department, we took an OER textbook, and the original book was $139, and now uh, five yeah. sections per term. We're on quarters, so five yeah. sections yeah. per term. The company. section size is 70 right. students, and it's a massive savings for students, and they're pretty thrilled about it. The, the book has a few um, uh, problems, but we're working on fixing that too. So yeah, being able to offer them a free textbook, especially at a community college where their tuition is often cheaper than purchasing all the textbooks for class. Uh, can you advance the slide for me, Chicago? Thank you. Value yeah. proposition two. It eliminates the need um, to work through financial problems and in purchasing their course materials. So it's not only just textbooks. It could be other types of materials they need to use for the course. And finding an OER alternative can really save them a lot of money. And, and the idea that they have the materials on the first day of class. And the universities sometimes, in my own course we do this, load all the textbook. It's actually on a website that the world can see, but it's also in Blackboard. And not only broken up, not only the entire book, but also broken up to the chapters that they're reading during different weeks. So they have that material uh, as soon as they have access to Blackboard. And they don't have to go to the bookstore. And you know, I always go into class and say, OK, who has the book? So I can show them what it looks like so they could go buy it. And uh, you don't need to anymore, because the book is there. They know it's there, and they, can get, they have it the first day. There's nobody left without a book or waiting for their paycheck so they can buy the book two weeks after the class has started. And that's been really, really super nice. Uh, next slide. Then some faculty have built, uh, particularly at San Marcos, they're very, very big on this, building a customized course that uses all open access materials that the students have access to and that map directly to the professor's lesson plan. I heard a guy speak uh, during OER week a couple weeks ago, and he did a course on uh, film. And it was remarkable the amount of materials that he had collected together and the amount of work it must have been. It was really impressive. And uh, San Marcos had him working with an instructional designer and the library very, very closely to build the materials that would make this course work. And he said the old textbook was like reading a phone book. And I think it was like a, a 150 bucks, maybe more than that. And he said it was just very much this film, this film. It was very factual. And he felt like he really made that course uh, come to life and a lot more interesting for students. So that was pretty nice. Next slide. Value proposition four, removes barriers to obtaining course materials. It improves the outcomes and the retention because students don't have, have to worry about that. Great. Keep going. Um, it does. It certainly helps establish a more equitable learning environment and a student-centric culture. And students are thrilled to not have to pay. But they're also thrilled to, um, to get the content in a different form. There's, there's some uh, students, uh, we did a survey, the California OER Council did a survey. And there were actually comments, not many, but some students said, I'm tired of staring at the screen. I can't spend my whole life on a, uh, look staring at a computer screen. And other people were a little more serious in their comments and said, you know, at first it took a, a little bit to get used to staring at a screen. Um, but then I transitioned. and and. Uh, uh, it really worked for me. And having access to the book to study, students liked having uh, balloon health in a textbook so that they didn't have to go flip through a glossary to find out what a term meant and things like that. And it uh, really helped, helps all students succeed. And if you're in a classroom where some people can afford the book, other people can't, or the bookstore runs out of copies, it eliminates all that, all those types of problems. Next slide. 
Okay, so the value propositions that Ruth just talked about can, of course, go in your email or um, talk about it in your presentation and um, so forth. Uh, so now um, I'm continue on, continuing on with the presentations that I've been giving to in, in meetings, but I present the success stories from the fall 2015 pilot project that we did. Um, so this is from us, but there are other success stories that, of course, you can fold into your presentation. Um, so the one example that we have is that we used in a corporate finance class a free online open textbook that was written by a UCLA faculty. Um, he also sells optional print version for $60, so there's an option for that. Um, this professor would have used or previously have assigned these two textbooks on the right-hand side of the screen, um, Principles of Corporate Finance, which cost $253 list price, um, or Corporate Finance um, from McGraw-Hill, another one from McGraw-Hill that is $193 dollars list price. And she had 69 students in the fall. The maximum enrollment is 98. But we calculated that if we just take the list price and multiply it by the 69 students, we saved about $17,000 in this one class alone. And she was recruited by um, one of our targeted emails. Uh, in fall 2015, we also ran Psych 2 with the um, introductory psychology textbook from OpenStax. So OpenStax has a free web version. Um, you could also download a PDF version, or you could purchase a print bound version for $39. Um, the professor agreed to use this textbook looking at the fact that they had, it had some slides already available for the course. Um, instead of what he would have assigned, which would have been the Essentials of Understanding Psychology by uh, McGraw-Hill, which would have cost um, $135 list price, and he has 570 students enrolled, so um, this class was able to save the students $76,950 had everybody bought a new textbook. We also did a student survey after we ran these two classes. Sorry, I don't have the results for the Business 134, but um, we did, did it for that class as well. Um, the, but the student survey showed that 50% uh, of the students read their textbook more often than they usually do in other classes. 40% of the students said that they read more of the textbook than they usually do, and 72% of the students did more than 80% of the assigned readings. Um, and we believe that this, it has to do with the accessibility of the textbook as well as the portability. You can read it um, anytime, anywhere, from your phone or laptop. And in the end, many students said that they liked the fact that the textbook was free and truly appreciated that. Um, so I usually end the, uh, the, my presentation with where to find OER and um, mentioned that not all courses will have appropriate OER, but we will try to, to, to search for one for you. And sometimes if I have time, I will go to these websites and open them up and show them um, what's in there so that 
they can feel like, okay, maybe I, it's not so hard to find an open textbook for my class, or at least I know where to go. Um, rewarding the faculty. Revising a course is time and energy consuming for faculty, so um, we believe that we should compensate the faculty that um, participate in our affordable course material initiative. But also, I, I think that rewards depend on your campus culture. Um, so whether it's going to be monetary compensation or course release, or professional development credits, or recognitions, awards, or something else. Um, I think that will depend on uh, what would be appropriate in what campus. So what we did at UCR is just straight monetary compensation. I have a little bit to and add to that. I mm -hmm. do think you aren't going to get faculty to participate without some kind of uh, perk. But one question that came up also at San Marcos was uh, that they had faculty that came to them and said, I'm already doing this. Can I participate? And the answer was no. Unfortunately, you know, if you're already doing it, then they can't give you a, a professional development stipend for something that already exists. But what they did do is they created a recognition for um, they called them Calm Heroes. Calm is the name of their program. And uh, they have a website that shows faculty that are um, using OER. And even though they weren't able to participate in the new programs, they got recognition for being an advocate for students' affordability and things like that. So I thought that was a nice way to recognize faculty that had already done an OER adoption but didn't qualify for compensation later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, we had a similar situation where um, after Psych 2 used OpenStax, other faculty in psychology started using OpenStax, and we were not able to compensate them for adopting that textbook because they had already been done. Um, but we have asked uh, if we could take a survey in, in her class and um, feature her on our website, and so um, and this faculty has been gracious enough to to agree to that. Okay, so I'm passing on to Ruth now. Anything right, else? Push Any my talk questions? Button. Great. If um, I had known Ron was on this call, I would have put the library ahead of the bookstore. And I can say for my own OER adoption, the bookstore and the library were critical. Uh, and we have a affordable learning initiative on campus. And, uh, and it's a committee that never meets. But I tell you, the three of us really are a close group. We meet informally and we email whenever anything's going on. And it, that is that has worked very well at Cal Poly Pomona. So the bookstore, what the bookstore can do for you often is that they're experts. They know how to work with publishers and how to get how to negotiate for a reduced price and uh, on books and on courseware that comes with textbooks and things like that. Um, and on different kinds of copies, e-textbooks. And you know, a lot of faculty are uncomfortable working with a publisher or negotiating the price, but the bookstore is great at it. Um, they're also aware of classes where the books don't sell because they don't want to eat that cost. And they know that uh, they'll walk up and down the rows and say, hmm, Psychology 200, none of these books are selling. There's something else going on. Um, uh, they also know more or less, I don't know how our bookstore person, she's a genie or something, and she knows what classes, the book renewal is about every three years, and she knows what classes are coming up for renewal. So if we could harness that and get, reach those faculty and say, hey, we know you're doing a textbook review, maybe consider an OER book. You know, that would work in our favor. Um, and most bookstores, a lot of people say, oh, the bookstore is just making money. Students say that because they don't know 
everything about the publishing market. But most bookstores have an option. If the student selects a book, it will show them this is how much it costs on Amazon. This is how much it costs. They show them an alternative so they get the cheapest thing they can from the bookstore. So the bookstore is very helpful with that, too. Um, great. Next slide. The library. <laughs> the library is great. Um, they are great at finding OER text, but also if somebody goes the route of finding materials for a course, I don't know how you would do that without the help of a reference librarian or OER librarian and their knowledge of uh, journals and how to get access to original st sources. Phenomenal. Um, also, many libraries have access to databases with free books online. At Cal Poly, we have Safari books online. And people have adopted those books in their courses. And I believe, I don't know how that works either, but I believe the library, if you can work with them, they'll, and they know you have 35 students in the class, they can say, OK, you need 15 licenses to access the text so that uh, people don't have to wait to gain access and things like that. 15 people logged on at, at the time. A librarian, I'm sure, could tell you more about that. Uh, library reserve, of course. And the library, like the bookstore, also many libraries offer printing services. So if you've got an OER book and you can get a cheap print copy for 15 bucks, 20% of students typically like to have a printed copy of the textbook because they like taking notes and uh, the tactile knowledge of how to get through the different topics in the book. Um, Great. The, some libraries have taken uh, it upon themselves to have a budget, and they, for an expensive class, they buy 20 textbooks and they check them out to students, and students check them back in, and the a new class gets to use the books during the next term. Uh, find original searches. It should say sources. Offer advice on copyright. A lot of faculty don't know about Creative Commons copyright. And typically, somebody in the library does, and they can help faculty with things like that. Or if they have a copyright issue, they can usually give them advice for that. Um, and it, on our campus, the library is the person who's leading, is, is the organization that leads affordable learning. And so that's often where people for affordable learning reside. Next. E-learning. I got a chance to work with our e-learning group last uh, fall, and it was really interesting to see the types of things they do. I wasn't aware of everything they offered, but a uh, great attribute that e-learning has is that people go to e-learning when they want to change a course, and so they're really ready to uh, make a change in the textbook, make a change in the delivery, or make a change in the materials. And so if e-learning knows about OER resources, they can um, make faculty that come into e-learning aware that there's alternatives to an expensive textbook. They're also expert at implementing content into whatever a university's learning management system might be. And so if a faculty has an OER textbook that they want to parse out into different weeks or they want to make available in multiple formats, e-learning can certainly help with that. Um, they're also expert in, well, disabled student services is the real expert, but often e-learning knows a lot about accessibility compliance and making sure videos have alternative, um, have captioning images and things have alternative text, and they're very good at helping faculty with that and everybody at the university. Next slide. I, I didn't think a lot about technology services until I saw the survey that we did during our OER adoption study on the California Council. And it came from a lot of universities that they, they had trouble accessing the textbook in class because there wasn't adequate Wi-Fi. And so if somebody has a campus plan where that's what they want to get money to implement, you know, the technology services would certainly be a part of that. Technology services also typically has a help desk that can solve problems for faculty and for students. So uh, on my campus, if a student can't get on the campus Wi-Fi, 
it's very it's a luxury for faculty. We just say go to the help desk. It's in building one, room 101, and they can walk right in and get help on anything using Blackboard, how to access uh, different campus resources and things like that. Though if they have a virus on their computer, they've got to go handle that themselves. Um, but uh, in the study we did, there were very, very few technical problems with the PDFs and things like that. But faculty, if you're in a course and you're trying to deliver your textbook and somebody says, it won't load on my machine, and the person doesn't know about uh, PDF formats or if it's a Kindle format and things like that, and they don't know how to help the student, helping you know, three students with all different hardware platforms and different formats, it could be really um, scary for a faculty member and they feel powerless that they don't know how to help the student. But if the help desk has that capability, it, it makes the adoption much, much easier. And if people know, oh, I get accustomed to going to a certain place for help, it can ease the burden on fa faculty and maybe make them happier to adopt. All right, next slide. I thought the other people I didn't mention in the in the previous slides, disabled student services, if you things have to be accessible, it's a law in California, and so they they may be critical in adopting a textbook or other materials. Students, certainly um, students are aware of OER and word of mouth as OER texts are adopted. I think is going to play a big role. Some universities have a faculty center, and the faculty center can often uh, help get the word out about OER and maybe point to different faculty or new faculty that might be interested in OER. Deans and provost, um, the provost has been critical in uh, giving OER on my campus a, a bigger voice because they're a very big advocate for saving students money, and so if the provost says, yes, OER, everybody else kind of falls in line. It's like, okay, what can we do? How can we uh, apply for this grant and things? And then on leveraging resources, I would say what works really well is um, uh, partnering with different events on campus, and e-learning gives, and the faculty center on our campus give a big event called PolyTeach, and I've talked them into doing a big session on OER, and you know, maybe a lot of faculty go to PolyTeach, and if there's a half hour at the end where they can learn about OER, maybe we'll get some more advocates that way, so they're trying to um, bridge onto existing committees and existing events. All right, and I think that's it. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> great, and I'd add also, I missed Teresa's uh, comment, that's a great idea. Faculty already using OER can participate by running or leading a faculty workshop. Great idea. All right. Nice to meet you over the chat, Ron. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Wait, everyone. Let's, let's stay on and figure out how to work it if you have time. <laughs>